very early 1860s, 70s steam locomotive. Great cutaway drawing because I can explain how they work and why they work. Uh, we essentially have four main parts to the steam locomotive. What's not on here is the tender that carried the water and the fuel. You see that behind any steam locomotive typically. A few exceptions to that. But essentially, you have a place to build a fire, which is called the fire box, appropriately enough. That heat is carried through pipes, usually well over 100 pipes, into what we call the smoke box, and then that is exhausted up through the stack. The fire box is surrounded by the boiler section, which is this entire thing, right up to the edge of the smoke box. This represents the water level. One of the most important things in a steam locomotive is water level. You can run out of fuel and nothing bad's going to happen. If you get low on water, really bad things are going to happen. Because you notice that water surrounds that firebox. And if that firebox is allowed to get too hot, it's going to fail. And you've got a lot of steam right here that's under pressure. And this is going to turn into a giant spaghetti ball explodes. So water is the critical thing. So what we're doing is we're using heat here to heat the water that's surrounding all those tubes. That turns into steam, which is all the white stuff here. It's collected in the upper section in this what we call a steam dome. You can always tell the steam dome because it'll have the whistle and it'll have the safety valve on it to make sure that if something goes wrong, hopefully that will open before this gets damaged. This is the throttle for the engineer. He opens this valve as necessary to collect the steam, goes down, we'll call it dry pipe, down into the cross end and down to the cylinders. See we have steam on this side right now pushing this piston to the back. Okay. The steam that was on this side is exhausted through this up through this little venturi, which helps create draft to pull that heat through. So it's a very, very efficient process. This is a wood-burning locomotive. How do I know that? It has this funny stack on the top. It has a screen over it and a deflector. If you have wood in your fireplace, you notice that not just smoke and heat go up the chimney, but live embers go up that chimney. If you're in Nevada, don't want those embers getting out of that stack. Because then you have a grass fire or a forest fire. That's not a good thing to have. So they collect those embers, which is why all wood burning locomotives will have this collector on the top. You notice other locomotives pretty much just have a standard straight pipe. So, okay? So, what we're trying to do now is turn that steam energy, and we operate uh, around 155 pounds on our. And we have a little demonstration here that works very well. It's a cutaway of this that operates. We have a steam chest on the top for the distribution. We have a piston, which you can see right here. And the way this one is configured right now, you can see steam is coming in this end, down through here, and it's going to push this piston this direction, which moves the rod, which makes the wheel go around. So I'm going to move this. And you see it pushing the piston, but I want you to watch this uh, block right up here on top, which is our valve. You notice right now all the steam's coming in here, and it's being exhausted over there. As it moves, this valve is going to transition. And you can see it moving forward mm -hmm. now. Yep. And now we can see that the steam comes in here, and it's pushing this piston this way. Okay. So a unlike a car point. where you have intake compression, power, exhaust. This, when it's moving, is powered either this way or this way at all times. There's two of these on the locomotive. The one on the other side is 90 degrees out of phase so that when it's, this one is transitioning, going through that changeover, the other one is in the middle and it's under full power. So you don't have any gaps in your power strokes. It's just a nice, smooth, constant operation that's an excellent uh, explanation. 
this is one of the greatest things for now, explaining it to people, because we tend to think of pistons like we have in a car, where one out of four is useful. This one, they're all providing power to the wheels and the train. So, all right. Well, that would be a good explanation for kids, especially because yeah. uh, I've been in museums before, and they they didn't give this type of an explanation to you uh, as you well as you did. Yeah, well, it, because this is static, and it's like, well, okay, what's it do though? Mm -hmm. This does that for yeah. you. Yeah. And you can actually see that uh, steam valve moving. It makes sense finally yes. yeah, until you've seen it. So, yeah. Certainly the best thing that I've ever seen for doing this. It would be great for schools and for kids. Mm -hmm. Very much. What we have here is something I like because it's a little unusual. When we tend to think of trains and steam locomotives, we always think of these huge black locomotives or fancy locomotives that haul passenger trains and long freight trains. We tend to forget about the little guys that do all the work. And this is one of those locomotives built by HK Porter Company. They built thousands of locomotives out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This one, as you can see from the builder's plate, is 1882. Unfortunately, it does not work. We can restore it to that point. The uh, DS and CD Railroad. Dayton, which is east of here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, from Dayton. Sutro, which was the owner, and the Carson Valley Railroad. It never really went into the Carson Valley. But its job was to haul ore cars from where the Virginia Truckee brought it down from the Comstock, dumped it into a tipple, and then they hauled it from that tipple out to the mill, which is down in the Carson Canyon, because they used water power in the early years of the Comstock to run the mills. Eventually, they went to steam power for a lot of the mills, and they were actually up in Gold Hill and Virginia City. So this was how they moved that ore around. And a lot of the mills around here had a small railroad. The VNT had the shops. So they would actually, if they needed to have their locomotives worked on, the VNT would go out there, they would put the locomotive on what they called a transfer car, which was a flat car. It was extra strong and had narrow gauge tracks on it. They would put the locomotive on there, haul it into the shops here in Carson City, and then they would fix what they needed to fix. So. so it's kind of nice. You'll see a lot of pictures of these little locomotives, but they, they tend to get ignored. I just like to stop and have people take a little time. It works just like everything else. You can still see we have a very small um, steam chest, a very small cylinder, very, it's just very compact. But um, it's, they needed to move that stuff. It's just a lot more efficient than feeding a lot of mules and horses. So. What would be the, how much tonnage for a small one like this? Boy, I can't answer that. Yeah, that's, yeah, there's so many numbers out there. I really don't like to quote numbers. <laughs> There'll be somebody out there watching it. <laughs> yeah. Being a museum, you have to be careful about separating fact and um, what I call alternative history. It's pretty much... Hey, we're now in the children's section of the museum. Uh, this is where we have displays that they can play with and things that they can enjoy. Behind you is the Whistling Billy, which is a mock-up of actually a locomotive that worked for one of the mills here, the Eureka Mill, out by Dayton, where the other locomotive also worked. This one happens to be wood. Uh, if we look inside, we see it has gauges and valves and levers and bells, and so the kids can just climb up in there and have a wonderful time playing with all that stuff. On the floor beside it, you will see track. It's uh, not real track, so it's lightweight. The kids can take it apart, put it together, uh, use the tie plates, use the uh, rail joiners and the nuts and the bolts, and uh, get a little feel for railroading. And uh, we actually go through a little track laying demonstration with them on that, so they can actually get to lay the track. So it's kind of a neat deal. Behind me is a map of 
a representation of the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. Down here in the left corner is Carson City. It's where the railroad started. A few miles away up in the hills, up on Mount Davidson is Virginia City, and this was the Comstock region. Virginia City is completely undermined. Gold Hill is one of the towns, Silver City is one of the towns. Dayton, which we talked about uh, with the Dayton Sutro Railroad, is uh, down here. The Sutro Tunnel was built by Mr. Sutro, which is where the Sutro came from on that little photo. Uh, this representation, the original railroad was built from here to Virginia City, and coincidentally from Virginia City to here. They started the railroad, they hauled lo two locomotives to Virginia City, and they hauled two locomotives, I'm sorry, two locomotives to Carson City, and two locomotives to Virginia City, and they built the railroad in both directions, so if they could get it done more quickly. Uh, seven tunnels total on the railroad. So they did have some tunnels to deal with. And from the time they left the canyon, this is Carson Canyon, Carson River, you'll see the mills that we talked about that processed the ore when they were using water. You recognize out here by date. Once they completed this part of the railroad, they then built the railroad from here to Reno in the upper left corner, where the Central Pacific Railroad, when it started, now the Southern Pacific Railroad is. It's part of the Transcontinental Railroad that they built in 1860. So the job of the VNT was to move ore from here to the mills down here. We talked about the Joe Douglas, the little narrow gauge locomotive. This is where that tip of one trestle was where they transferred the ore. And here's the Western Miller, the real locomotive that just went to stop. It's a good representation. In 1907, they built an extension that ran from Carson City 15 miles to the south and picked up cattle, sheep, agricultural products as well, so that was part of the business later in the industry. So, it's a nice representation. You can kind of see everything without being extra fancy. Because you can't put it into a book. You can only do it by seeing it and have somebody explaining it to you. small piece of equipment that most people have no idea ever existed. It's a little four-wheel cart. In the background, we can see a locomotive coming into the valley. In front of it, we can see where they're going to put the rail down. We can see where the graders have gone through and laid out the roadbed for where the railroad's going to go. And so they're now ready to put track down on that roadbed. And this car was developed to expedite that entire process. When they were building the Transcontinental Railroad, the Central Pacific building from Sacramento essentially to Promontory Summit, the Union Pacific going from Omaha to Promontory Summit, were being paid by the mile. That means you want to do it as quickly as you can. So you get pretty innovative. It's a very simple car, it's a box frame. If we look closely, we'll see that on the corners there are rollers. They can put about 12 pieces of rail on the cart. We can see that happening over here in the diorama. The cart would be loaded up with rail. The ties would already been put down by another crew. They would load the cart, maybe use a horse, use the right arm right here, to pull it up to where we're going to lay the rail. There will be uh, two or three gentlemen on each side. They will have hooks or uh, claws like that where they can pick up the rail, much like the old ice uh, tongs. I call them tongs for rails. You would have the four, we'll say it's four, and you have a supervisor, of course. Two guys would be here, two guys would be there. There would be one more man who had a wooden gauge. See it down here? It's made out of wood. And that will make sure that the tops of the rails are the proper gauge for the wheels on the locomotives and the cars. So the supervisor will go pull. The gentleman will pull the rail onto these rollers. 
And then he would say something like move, and they would move the rail until it cleared the car. He would go down, he would put it down on the ties. The man with the gauge would put the gauge on it to align it with those two rails. And once that was done, they would move the car forward, pull, move, down, and they would continue that process. The immediately behind them would come a couple of guys with spikes and malls, and they would drive the spikes. So it's a very efficient system. Once the car is empty, they would flip that car up on the side. They would roll another full car in place, put this car back on the tracks, and go to the So it's an extremely, extremely efficient system. Um, we did it outside here for a TV presentation for Impossible Engineering. And we found that we could lay about 12 pieces of rail, I'm sorry, we could actually put down about eight pieces of rail in one minute when you got it organized. So you can see you're moving very quickly. Never thought about the fact that they had to maintain the distance between the two rails absolute. Sure. It's not like, you know, they would fall <laughs> right off the rails. That had to be a maintained distance. Never thought about that. Well, we're out here in the yard in our game next door. We keep most of the equipment that we operate. Behind us, it's outside today in the sunshine, which is wonderful, is a 19 inside the back of the McKean car. Uh, this is where the table service was when it was a restaurant. It's very futuristic. A lot of people think of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the Nautilus here. It almost gives you that sensation. It certainly does. It certainly does. It's just a fabulous piece of equipment. Uh, just a little highlight I like to point out. The artwork you see on the panels above, we're not sure it's exact. We have pictures of McKean's that have that in it. We do not have a picture of this car with that in it. So that was a little bit of a reach in the restoration. But we knew they did use that pattern, so that's what cool. It was all hand done by a commercial artist who's one of our volunteers. That was quite a job for him. Say so. Make it exactly the same or so precise. So the car is restored to as it was when it was delivered in 1910. We do operate it. Uh, its capacity was 84 people. There are 25 rows of seats and one bench. 25 sets of seats. That means there's three people on each of these benches. Well, 1910, that might not have been a problem. Today, we don't see three people in many of these benches <laughs> or many of these seats. So we have all gotten taller and bigger in other ways as well, for the most part. It has this back section and the front section, several stories around, uh, not necessarily first class, second class, it's all pretty much the same seating, but ladies did not ride with people who were smoking cigars, chewing tobacco, or doing things like that. That wasn't quite. So that was part of the separation. <laughs> it does have two toilets. They are what we like to call direct deposit toilets. When you go in there, there's a sign that says do not use while standing in the station because they literally do not have anything in the 
bottom of the toilet. It's like a moving outhouse. So you only use it out in the country because the townspeople didn't like you using it in town for obvious reasons. So, but it was 1910. We can kind of understand that. Just wanted to bring you in here. It's such a gorgeous car. If you visit us again in the summer. What is the fun to have you eaten dinner in this dining room? If you ever come back, we do have a schedule on our website. It's the Nevada State Railroad Museum. You can Google that and it'll come up. And it shows the schedule for when we operate our steam trains and we operate our two motor cars. Again, 4th of July weekends are a big weekend because we run all five pieces in the court. It's that weekend. Where do you go? We have a loop of track here, and then north we have a siding where we can do uh, switching and move the locomotive from the front to the back, etc. Typically do a wristband, uh, one fee, you can come and go all day, ride as much as you want. Uh, not many places you can watch two 1875 steam locomotives operate, and they're out running around. This is running, a passenger train is running by the steam locomotive. So it's a big weekend for us. We really enjoy being out here letting people enjoy this equipment. One of the big things about this museum is we think you should have the opportunity to ride on it and smell it and feel it, rock and roll and as well as this equipment did. So it's been really a fabulous thing. We were here one fourth of July. You were probably watching fireworks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you can't be do a cannon. Of course, just not the pictures are her pulling the string yeah. and the cannon over at uh, um, 4th of July. Yeah. Hey, Jack, you didn't, can you see something about those? Okay. You run it? Okay. Uh, the ventilation in the car is a little bit unique. You can see all the portholes. Uh, can be open, but if it's winter, you don't want to do that. On the top of the roof, there are big square inlets that bring the air into the cabin, down to the floor, and along the floor, you can see on the sides a, a channel with holes in it. The air comes in there. Overhead, we have vents that we can open and close, and that's how we evacuate the air. There's actually a venturi up in here that creates a low pressure that constantly moves the air from the cabin outside again. Anytime the car is moving forward or backward. Excellent. Oh, you know, we've been to the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit. Well, you know, the California Railroad is huge. The museum is huge. But they don't want it. It's all inside, behind screens. Don't touch. Well, how do you raise the money, though, to be popular? Uh, just people buying tickets and then stay funded. Uh, we're not gasoline. It's not gasoline. <laughs> it's not diesel fuel. Kerosene? It is kerosene, but highly refined kerosene, which is commonly called jet fuel. So our 1905 steam locomotive is fired with jet fuel. The reason I mention that is you said, how can we afford it? Well, it's free. If you store fuel, liquid fuels, in tanks or in a truck and the temperature changes overnight and goes down, Water. in an old house, what do you get on the inside <coughs> of the windows? More Condensation. So, and that goes to the bottom of the tank, be it in an airplane or a truck or a storage tank. And you don't want to put that in an airplane before it goes and flies. <laughs> because shortly after takeoff, that's going to get to the engines. It's not going to be a good thing. So they drain the trucks daily. And they can't throw that fuel away, so they save it. And we pick it up and bring it down here. Run it through a water separator and put it in our steam loader. So I love telling people when we're running, Very cool. you're riding behind a 1905 steam locomotive powered by jet fuel. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful thing. The Air Force thing is coming out. <laughs> I love telling you. We're now standing in what was the very first coach on the Virginia and Trucking Railroad. It was actually built in Virginia City. When they first started building the railroad, remember I mentioned they started from Carson City and Virginia City. They had a shop up there where they actually built this car. It was originally coach number one. They built four. Inside we saw that fancy restored car, which was number four. 
The VNT did something a little strange for railroads. When they bought four new coaches, they put one through four on the new coaches and renumbered the old coaches. This became number eight. So it went from one to eight. Apparently, two became seven, three became six, and four became three. No one that I'm aware of knows how why they did that, but they did. The amazing thing about this car, it was built in 1869. So next year is its 150th anniversary. Mm -hmm. It has never been restored. Oh. Oh. I yes. noticed a few holes in the wall. Oh. <laughs> it looks old because it is old. Yeah. It has been taken care of. But it has never gone through a full restoration like that coach number four in there. Oh. No one has ever gone, oh, we need to make it look like it was brand new. It's, so. so um, are you doing something special for its 150th? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> that maybe the restoration yeah. would be. It's also the 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad next year in May. Up in mm. Promontory, Utah. Yes. So, the car served on the VNT. Uh, it's a pretty plush car, very comfortable. Uh, it's fun to ride on because it kind of rocks and rolls. Uh, pretty basic, but very comfortable. We use this car on the Santa trains. We use the car behind it, which was built in 1873. It is a miner's car. It is not nearly as plush as this. And it has never been restored either. It has been maintained and taken care of while it was in various uses. The primary difference is it has benches in it, just wooden benches that run the length of the car. For some reason, they didn't want those miners in this car, particularly after they got off work in the mine after eight or 10 hours. Another reason might be mining in the Comstock is very different than the typical mines you see in Colorado or California or other places. That is typically hard rock mining, or it might even be soft rock mining. If it's hard rock, you can dig the, well, I'll call it a tunnel, into the rock, and you don't need to put up shoring because it's solid rock. It's granite or it's limestone or something. Soft rock may be soft, and they may actually put wood shoring timbers in there. Mount Davidson, which is where the Comstock is, Virginia City is, it's where the mines are in that region, is a volcano. It's a volcanic mountain. And that rock, if you've ever handled lava rock, is just full of air. It's got big air pockets in it. So as soon as you start cutting that tunnel and move on, that rock starts coming back together. So they had to shore most of the mines up which is why they had that huge lumber yard that I talked about earlier. They needed all that lumber to build the mills. A lot of it is underground holding those mines up so they don't collapse, holding the shafts. So. That volcanic mountain is still warm. As you drive around this area, you'll see a lot of hot springs where you can go sit in the hot springs pools and um, relax. The miners, when they were down in that mine, were working in temperatures from 120 to 140 degrees. It was very difficult work. The team that went down there, there would be two teams on the crew. They would work for 15 minutes on the face with their single jacks or their drills or their whatever, and a candle or two. And they would work 15 minutes and they would go back to what was called a cooling room. And the other half of the crew would go up and work the face, drilling the holes to set the charges to blast the rock and the ore out. And they would do that for the whole shift. While the Comstock was at its boom, they would haul over a million pounds of ice a year down into those mines to cool those rooms. The deepest mines up there, sections of mines, are over 3,000 feet deep. So they went down a long, long way. And when they came up from work, they probably didn't smell real good either. <laughs> Which would be another reason not to put them in this car. <laughs> so. But it's really nice to get the ride around in these cars. Yeah, it just is. It's a wonderful thing. So, any questions?
Tom, anything. I'm going to get to what your question is. Well, it looks like these seats would fit. They do this. So my question is, if you hadn't asked, I was going to ask you, why do they do this? There's a reason you can do this. Well, my assumption is, is to be riding forward all the time. I'm yeah. going up a mountain as good. Uh, not necessarily up a mountain, just riding, period. Uh, if we're going to Reno today, the train's going to be going that way. Yeah. Most people, if the train's going that way, and I'm one of those people, by the way, if I have to sit in this seat facing that direction, and this car's going to rock and roll, going around curves and oh, rail geez. joints. About 10 minutes north of town, they may know what I had for my last meal. <laughs> Most people tend to get nauseous riding backwards in vehicles. So this lets them face forward. Because when we get to Reno, we're not going to turn this entire train around. Just switch the engine. We're going to take the engine off that end, turn it around, run it down to this end of the train and going back to Carson City we can put all the seats so everyone can face that direction. That's the primary reason for doing this. Well, I don't know. What? Well, you're an old Air Force man. You possibly have been some flying in the Air Force. Yeah. <laughs> they had a lot of the passenger planes that were, you flew backwards. Or sideways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, the sideways was nothing. Yeah, but airplanes don't rock and roll like this car does. <laughs> I mean, I, I can actually get this thing rocking just by doing this, right? And, and now you can imagine the tracks. Now they have welded rail, and it's all laser aligned, and it's perfectly smooth. And it's, it has better bedding than the right Exactly. You know, this, not so much. <clears throat> this car's constantly pitching and rolling. I can, I can just imagine the, the track when a car went over the way they were built, that, how far that rail sunk. <laughs> Not super far, but it did, yeah, absolutely, because the ties settled, and, you know, it rains, and it snows, and it freezes, and thaws, and the ballast gets loose, and, yeah, it, it does, it moves. It's a big, big thing, maintaining track. Yeah. All right, I'm going to have you look at that other car. We can't get off the cars because we're kind of in the no-go zone of the museum back here. Before we keep things out of the way of the public. We'll go out on the platform now. And we have an all the deluxe stuff because we actually have cushions. One of the interesting stories is this car right back here. It looks like it burned. Yes. That's because it did burn. Oh. <laughs> that car, this car over here, and the number 27 engine, the black one inside, sat in a park by the airport. And it was a VNT kind of a, I don't want to say memorial, but you get the idea. Well, young teenage boys camping out on a summer evening mm -hmm. decided that a campfire was a good idea inside a wooden rail car. <laughs> Didn't work out well for them. <laughs> the only good news is that that car is extremely well preserved because charcoal is an excellent preservative. It absorbs moisture, it releases it, it protects the wood, <laughs> but it is never going to be restored, most likely. No, but there's a lot of parts that can be made, made use of yeah. in the future. Well, it's just kind of a good object lesson. Mm -hmm. Think about what you do sometimes. The car beside us is a very special car. It was built by a company named Brill. They built two of those to sell rail cars to the uh, railroads in the U.S. in the 1870s. They did a national tour with them. They sold them to the Virginia and Truckee when they were done with their tour. And uh, we have both of them here. Maybe someday we'll get to restore one and keep the other in a state of what I call arrested decay. <laughs> we, as near as we can figure out, they never sold any of those cars, so we may have the only two that ever existed. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we have a lot of VNT equipment, and talking about these cars and those cars, how have they lasted this long? I said they took care of them. Well, I was talking about who took care of them. 
1937, Cecil B. DeMille made a movie called Union Pacific. Yeah. It was about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Yeah. Well, he needed 1870, 1880 railroad cars and engines. If you watch that movie, the four locomotives are all former VNT locomotives. Most of the passenger cars are VNT passenger cars. It's that, that, the four inside. And they took care of it. Obviously. Then who used it? What was a big movie genre in the late 30s, 40s, and 50s, and even into the early 60s? Cowboys, westerns. Oh, sure. <laughs> and they had their little quarter mile of track that came into town on a curve, and they had a water tank and a depot, and then they could leave town and go around the corner. So they didn't need a whole railroad, they just needed a quarter mile of a railroad. This, this the replica. Thing. Yeah. So they took care of it because they filmed inside as well as outside. Mm -hmm. Then some of it ended up at tourist railroads, and they took care of it because they were trying to preserve steam locomotives, and they needed something passengers could ride on, so they took care of that. Then finally it was so old and dilapidated, or not dilapidated, but the equipment was not compatible with modern standards, so Federal Railway said, no more. You have to get newer equipment because people are paying you and you need modern, safe equipment. Now all the museums are happy. So we get it all back. <laughs> so we have it back. Unfortunately, that car is actually in very good shape for its age. Yeah. But it's still going to take a lot of time and effort to restore it. I've got a question for you. Sure. Speaking of the age of this car, I'm looking down here, and it looks like they got steam-operated braking on it. Well, it's not steam. It's actually air. Air brakes? Air brakes. At that point Original. in time, I wouldn't have thought that they would have had air brakes. <laughs> no, but they used these cars all the way up into the 30s. And so once Mr. Westinghouse came up with, well, I'll call it the most efficient of the air brake systems, there were several. The government got The involved. government <laughs> made them. The other thing you're looking at there is that automatic coupler. Yeah. The knuckle couplers. That isn't what they used. No, originally, it was a pin. They used a link and a pin in mm -hmm. these cars. We still have link and pin equipment. The Inyo inside, the pretty shiny locomotive, and the Glenbrook are link and pin. Because the Glenbrook is like it came out of the factory in 1875. So when we put a car behind it to run, when it's running around, it's a link and pin. And one of the brakemen has to do that. And it's not our favorite thing. Because there's a pocket that's about this deep, a link that's about this long, and there's two pins. So you put the link in the pocket, put one pin in, then you hold that link while the locomotive either pushes this card into you, and you make sure that link goes in the pocket and drop that other pin in place. And keep your fingers out. And of you're way. in between the cars. There's not a lot of room down there. No. Yeah. We cheat. <laughs> We have one guy up on the platforms, because usually we have a platform on the car we're doing, and he'll have the pin. And the brakeman will be out here with a an axe handle. It's commonly called a brake wheel for this thing. And we will hold that link up with that axe handle instead of putting our fingers in there. And the other guy will drop the pin into place. Yeah, it's, it's not like something idea. that you want to do. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of brakemen lost digits and hands and over the years, yes. Some of them they would retrain as telegraphers if that happened to them. If they were a really good employee. Ratchet and chain locking brakes. Yep. Yeah, you always have these just in case that air brake system works. Yeah. And it's, it's Mr. Westinghouse's system. Uh, the reason it was one of the better is it's a fail proof system. We think that they're going to use that air to put the brakes on, right? just the opposite. We actually use that air to take the brakes off. <laughs> and then we use a secondary tank that will put the brakes on. So the way it works, when we, we have a pump on the locomotive that pumps up the air pressure, and when it, the whole line is full of air, it'll actually release the brakes. Cylinder. Now, there's a tank that that air goes in with a check valve, so it can only go in, not out, that same line. So that if the cars come apart, these hoses will automatically disconnect. So the air will call it 100 pounds, just to use an easy number. 
So we have the airline that's holding the brakes off with 100 pounds, and we have that tank over there that has 100 pounds that can push on the brakes. So as long as the air pressure in the line is higher than the pressure in the tank, the brakes stay off. If we have a catastrophic failure in the line, the train comes apart, the coupler breaks, whatever happens, the train comes apart, the airline goes to zero, and every car has its own tank, and that 100 pounds is going to set the brakes on every car and the locomotive on the train. We're here to display about the shops on the VNT. They were very extensive shops. Um, it was a U-shaped building, two wings, and then the end was where the tracks were for the engine house, which we have a picture of here. It had a machine shop, which is this, 1800s, no electricity, had a steam locomotive, it drove a belt pulley system up in the ceiling, other belts came down to the machines, and every machine had a wheel, and it was driven by a leather belt. That's the way it was all done back then. Very interesting picture. We had a blacksmith shop for uh, making various pieces of wrought iron, a foundry where they could make their own castings, side rods, wheels, um, the end caps on the journals, and all those kinds of things, and a carpenter shop where they could do repairs and actually build cars. Back to the foundry here a little bit. If you're making mold, you need to have a pattern. If you have sand molds, put the pattern down in there, pack sand around it, put the top on, pack more sand around it. So these are not metal, these are actually wood. Pattern makers were very, very uh, talented. And I had one here a couple of years ago, it taught me a little lesson, I remember. So these are exactly like what you're molding. In the end of the depot, down by that little, or the interpretive center, those big pieces of metal hanging on the wall, those were not metal, they were actually patterns from the shop. They were gears and things that were cast in the shop. He said, well, this is not exactly like what you want. Because you take that mold apart, you take out the wooden pattern, you put it back together, you pour hot metal in there. Emphasis on hot. What happens when it cools? It's going to get just a little bit smaller. Bit. So the pattern has to be just that much oversized. Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, very, very talented people. Highly respected professionals. One a pattern that says state prison. <laughs> well, they did a lot of work. And I mentioned that they repaired one of the, uh, this is the number one press down at the Mint here in Carson City. And they got a crack in it, and they put this plate, they took it down to the shops across the street. That Mint is still down there, came back, and our 150th anniversary of statehood, all of the uh, commemorative points were put out somewhere in Boulders. And they work that every last Friday when they use it. And you can win and you can win and buy a blind and watch it. Stamp your, stamp your coin. So it's, it's a great thing to do. One of the things that I like about it is it's simple. It's very lightweight. But there's some engineering in there that we wouldn't normally think about. You don't really notice carefully at the wheels, you'll notice there's some rivets on the outer edge. That's actually in the section of the gutter. Because if you're going up a steep grade, like you had going up in the Comstock, and you have a metal wheel on a wet rail, not a lot of traction. So is that wrong? And those are two sets of pedals. If you look carefully, this sprocket on this set of pedals is bigger than the sprocket on the other set of pedals. So you have a high gear and a low gear. Right. Very simple handbrake. And the story is that occasionally mom and one of the kids would ride it up to Old Hill, which is a 2% grade on the hill. Pick up the mail, buy coffee, rice, flour, whatever they need for the next couple of weeks, and then ride it back down. Really like this.
bit about the uh, supervisor's card over there, the Vosby, which wasn't here. And that was his uh, really fancy transportation since he was the boss. If you were a part of the work crew, however, this was your transportation. You've seen them in cartoons and you've seen them in movies. Um, railroads weren't real notorious for paying people to have fun. So, the question arises, why would they have this on the railroad? Well, if we have to change something on the railroad that's out of town, maybe a switch stand, we have to get that new switch stand out there and we need to get our tools out there. So we put four or six guys on this cart, but where do we put the equipment? So when the guys were using this cart, they would have a small cart that had a flat deck behind it, and that's where they hauled everything. So we're going to have fun doing this. They were working when they were doing it because they were hauling their cargo. A couple simple rules. Keep both feet on the deck, both hands on the bar. I need you to take about half a step back. And something you don't hear very often in your life anymore, please do not bend your knees. Because you're going to push down on that bar. You have a tendency to bend your knees, and that bar is going to meet your knees. So we don't want that to happen. I'm going to help you since we're the only two on here. We're going to push real hard to start. Once it's rolling, it's real easy. Okay? So you're going to bend at the waist, right? And we're going to push. I'm going to have you push down gently and see which way it goes. Okay, that's the wrong way, so we'll stop. I will push and you pull, and we'll go all the way up to the turn table. Ready? Push hard the first two times. for the ride. Thank you for the privilege. All right, we're out here in the annex. Uh, two years ago, this restoration was complete. It's our other 1875 wood burning locomotive. It is a narrow gauge locomotive. It worked for a lumber company up on Lake Tahoe. It's as it came out of the factory in 1875. No air brakes. Lake had been coupled. See, it's winterized. Everything is opened up. All the plugs are out, so it doesn't freeze. Don't want all that water to freeze up in there. And separate our plumbing. Again, this is one of those pieces of equipment that we operate pretty much on major holidays. So come out to the museum and you can watch it run around. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the tour. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, if you want to check our schedule, Google Nevada State Railroad Museum. It's on our website. That will link you to the website. You can go there anytime. You can see some videos if you uh, do a Google search for steam operations in Nevada State Railroad Museum. This has been a fantastic tour. And I don't think I would ever say thank you enough. Once is plenty. And you're very welcome. I enjoy having people come visit us. It's nice to meet you. Have a safe journey back to Florida. Thank you.